Next, I'd like to talk about an approach called uh, Design for Trust. Traditionally, chip designers have been optimizing for area power and performance of their designs, and uh, recently, testability and reliability have also been added to this mix. Now that trust is becoming an issue for integrated circuits, we'd like to talk about Design for Trust as well. So in this and the next couple of modules, I'll talk about Design for Trust approaches. In particular, I'll uh, talk about logic locking, split manufacturing, and IC camouflaging. In this first module, I'll get into details of logic locking. So Design for Trust uh, is mainly about being proactive during the design stage. What can a designer do during the design of their, of their chip um, to make it resilient, to make the design uh, resilient against all the threats that are out there. The threats being counterfeiting, Trojans, IC piracy, reverse engineering, etc. And uh, there are various techniques. Uh, among these, three of them are quite popular. Logic locking, speed manufacturing, and IC camouflaging. Now, which one of these techniques to pick really depends on the model, the threat model, and the business model that the design company is following. It's a matter of whether the design company is trusting the fabrication company, whether the foundry is trusted or not. And also, it's a matter of whether the end users are trusted or not. So, if both the foundry and the end users are trustworthy, then life is good. There's not much to do. But if one of these entries or both of these entries are uh, not trusted, then one of these techniques can be can be utilized. So logic locking, for instance, is a technique that can protect against untrusted foundries as well as untrusted end users. And I'd like to start talking about logic locking in this presentation module. The idea in logic locking is to incorporate locks into the netlist. Uh, the locks are in the form of added hardware into the netlist, into the design, and this added hardware is controlled by a secret key. Um, the secret key is a binary vector, so it's, it's a combination of zeros and ones. So it is this locked netlist that goes through the unprotected or potentially untrustworthy design and manufacturing flow. And at the end of this flow, when the chips are produced, the chips are produced off of the locked netlist rather than the original netlist. So um, when a chip is manufactured by the fab to make it functional, the secret key needs to be loaded uh, on a tamper-proof memory on the chip. That's when the chip is activated. That's when the chip becomes functional. Without the secret key in place, the chip produces garbage. It will simply not work. So here's a very simple example that illustrates uh, logic locking. On the left, we have the original netlist with three inputs and one, one, one output. And on the right, we have the same netlist, but locked. Uh, this netlist is locked by using these key gates shown in red and controlled by a secret key that consists of three bits. In this example, the correct key is 110. So in the original netlist, in the original design, a, an input vector of 000 is supposed to produce a zero, and in the uh, locked netlist, this input vector 000 produces a zero, the correct output, only when the correct key is in place. If, uh, for instance, a wrong key is in place, then the output may be wrong. In this example, instead of a zero, we get a one. So uh, the idea in logic locking is to make sure that the circuit produces the correct outputs when the correct keys or the correct key or the secret key has been loaded on the tamper-proof memory. Logic locking provides protection in two different forms. First of all, even if somebody reverse engineers a chip, what they'll see in front of them is this lock netlist. And this lock netlist could be implementing one of many different functionalities depending upon the value of the secret key. And without knowledge of that secret key, the exact functionality or the exact design details would not be known to an attacker. That's uh, protection number one. Protection number two is against an untrusted fab who would potentially overbuild, overbuild a chip, but without the secret key, again, the chips that are produced will not be useful because they'll be uh, producing garbage. They wouldn't be producing correct outputs 
in the absence of the secret key. So logic locking provides protection for the design IP as well as the fabricated chips. Of course, these forms of protection is what logic locking intends to deliver, but for that, logic locking itself needs to be secure. Uh, we could talk about attacks on logic locking itself, and that's why we first define a threat model. So when somebody attacks logic locking, meaning when somebody wants to break logic locking, the defense in place, they need to determine the secret key of logic locking because once they figure out the secret key, they can understand the hardware implementation details, they can unlock all the chips that are produced because all they need will be the secret key to be loaded uh, on the chip's memory. So that's the goal of an attacker. And for that, the attacker has access to a couple of assets. And these assets are, number one, a functional chip that can be obtained from the market. So this is a chip that works because the, the, uh, the secret key has already been loaded on it. And uh, this chip can be used by the attacker as an oracle. And the attacker can apply inputs and uh, observe the outputs or the responses of the chip. So that they can thus um, produce input output pairs out of this oracle, this, this functional chip. And the second asset that, that an attacker has access to is a reverse engineered netlist, um, which is the locked netlist itself. So the locked netlist has all the implementation details except for the secret key, which is what the attacker tries to uh, figure out. So with these two pieces of information, uh, the attacker can apply simulation tools um, on the lock net list. They can produce an input pattern, which they would then apply it to the oracle, to the functional chip, to get the responses from the chip. And from these responses, the attacker tries to infer the secret key bits. Indeed, there have been a few attacks uh, on logic locking over the years. Um, back in 2012, we developed the first attack that we called the sensitization attack. In the same work, we actually developed the threat model that um, all the attackers are using today. Um, so the threat model, as I described, ha assumes that the attacker has access to a lock net list as well as a functional chip. Um, and then a um, couple of years back, another attack has been developed uh, by the Princeton group um, it was called the SAT attack, and this attack was quite powerful. It was, it broke all the defenses that were in place um, back back then, and then the community developed defenses against these attacks. And very recently, we uh, developed another attack that we called the signal quality secure attack, that targeted uh, some of the techniques that were resilient to the previous attacks. These attacks helped push the community to develop more and more secure logic locking solutions. And indeed, over the years, what we've seen in this area has been defenses and attacks um, developed and proposed in an iterative fashion. Um, a decade ago, um, the first logic locking solution was proposed by, the, by two groups, uh, University of Michigan and Rice, and then we proposed uh, in 2012 and 15, um, another logic locking solution. And then we developed the first attack back in 2012, as I mentioned. Um, then we developed the defense against the sensitization attack. And since then, attacks and defenses were developed uh, in, an, in an iterative fashion. Um, and uh, recently, another attack that was called AppSat was also proposed. And this, this attack was quite interesting in the sense that it showed the research community that simply combining multiple defenses together uh, will not be sufficient in terms of uh, combining the strengths of these defenses. This attack can actually reduce the compound defense into the strongest one of the constituents. In the meantime, there were other, other attacks uh, proposed by assuming different threat models. For instance, um, we've used uh, test data to extract the secret key of logic locking, or we've looked at the power consumption behavior of a chip to extract its um, secret key. Um, and uh, recently, we came up with a defense technique called TT lock that we think can resist against all these uh, attacks out there. To summarize, 
This uh, presentation module was on a design for trust technique called logic locking. The idea is to lock a design based on a secret key and uh, this solution protects against untrusted fabs as well as untrusted end users. Thank you very much for listening.